No one else can speak the words on your lips. Drench yourself in words unspoken. Live your life with arms wide open. Today is where your book begins. The rest is still unwritten. That's unwritten by Natasha Bedingfield. Welcome to Industry Outlaws United. I'm your host, Brandon E. Brooks, the man with the Indie Escape plan. Joe Ridgely is in the box next to me. How are you, Joe? I am excellent. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Looking forward to a great guest tonight, one I've been an admirer of for many, many, many years. So uh, uh, you got to say it with a little more enthusiasm than that, though. Man. Looking forward to a great <laughs> there guest you go. tonight. Yeah! <laughs> it's going to be awesome. Yeah. Like I said, she's a phenomenal actress and, and, and a lot of other things, too, that we'll talk about tonight. Uh, behind the scenes. So thank you, Sean Smithson, for checking in. Appreciate your support every week, brother. Uh, yeah. So Joe, what's going on with you, man? Any news on the IE front? Well, we got a bunch of things going on. Uh, one thing I could somewhat touch base on right now is the Indie Escape Network is teaming up with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre alumni. We're, we're going to help them with a charity event that they have going on to uh, help people out over in the Ukraine. We're going to be live at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre house nice. with at least three Texas Chainsaw Massacre alumni. We're going to have CJ Robles there. We're going to have Terry Gerald there covering the scene. It's going to be absolutely amazing. And speaking of Terry Gerald, uh, Harlow's Haunt is going to be at Phantasm Orlando. August 19th through 20, the 21st. And they're going to have a panel for their new movie coming out and they're going to premiere their trailer. And, and, and some guy, I'm not going to mention any names is going to be moderating it. So <laughs> nice. Awesome. Yes. Awesome. Looking forward to that film and seeing what uh, Terry comes up with. You know, I'm a fan of indie horror, so it's, uh, it's near and dear to my heart as I do a lot of it. So, Congrats to Terry and everybody uh, involved, and I can't wait to see the premiere of that. Right on. Awesome. So uh, without further ado, can we uh, play the tribute video for tonight's guest, Mr. Ridgely? We absolutely can. scary image right now so we're gonna go back to my old radio and podcast days brandon had to bail out for a second he's having a little bit of a technical issue so we're just gonna keep things rolling let's see what we got well wait a minute there's the man of the hour 
Uh, we, Brandon, you good? Uh, can you hear me? I can. Awesome. Well, let's hope that all is well. <laughs> like, all right. Uh, so again, I, I missed the reel a little bit, but I, I know it played because I'm getting texts about it. Uh, without further ado, amazing. Yeah, second, now we're gonna say I, I was trying. I was gonna try to bring conversation up, but Terry, yes, we just mentioned you and Harlow's Haunt and the actual event going on in August. So make sure you replay that. But I apologize, Brandon. Go ahead. No, no, not, not, that's fine. Th thank you. Thank you for being here, Terry. Without further ado, tonight's guest, uh, amazing actress, Cynthia Preston. Hello. Yes. There she is. Hey. Hello. Hello, Cindy. Thank you for joining us tonight on IOU. My pleasure. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I didn't get to see the, you watching the tribute video. We have a running thing that Joe gets to see it and I don't. So uh, hopefully you enjoyed that. So <laughs> yeah, I don't know where you got some of those pictures. That's great. <laughs> awesome. So there's awesome. one of me and Raul Trujillo from Black Fox that I'm like, that's not from my collection. I don't have that picture. I want that picture. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So, uh, so, so we start off, usually I start off asking the guests like, like, just give a little bit about your background, where you where you're from, and what type of kid you were when you uh, when you were coming up before like all the craziness of the entertainment business started. Oh, the business. Um, I grew up in the suburbs of Toronto. Uh, I am the youngest of six kids. I have a massive family. I have seventeen nieces and nephews, and thirty eight great nieces and nephews, and that's before cousins. Like, it's wow, crazy. <laughs> um, I was a really, really, really shy kid. And that turns out to be how I got into this crazy business in the first place. Oh, wow. Because uh, my mom sent me to a self-improvement course. Because she said, you're not better than anyone else, but you're not worse than anyone else. So we got to do something to bolster your confidence. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. So speak a little bit about that. She sent you where? She sent me to a self-improvement course. It was advertised as a, I don't remember, it was a million years ago, but it was mm -hmm. some kind of thing like that. And so I went and it turned out to be a self-improvement slash modeling course. Oh, so okay. when I finished the course, there were modeling agents that were looking at the girls. I don't remember any boys being in there. <laughs> um, I remember lots of boys from modeling later, but um, so anyway, I got an offer for representation from a mo modeling agent. And um, I said, okay, like even though I was shy, I had a really good work ethic, I think from my parents. Mm -hmm. um, my parents were, much older they had um a whole batch of kids before they got me so when i was i was adopted when i was adopted when my parents were 45 two of my siblings were having kids so mm. i have a nephew um and a niece that came on the scene were born at the same time as i was adopted so my siblings were like my aunts and uncles and mm. my nieces and nephews were like my half siblings because they're around half the time and then then it went down closer and some of my siblings were not like it. It's complicated. Anyway, um, back to what I was saying. Uh, the modeling um, led to an acting offer. I had modeled just for flyers and catalogs and stuff like Sears and Love's Baby Soft. And then I got an offer to go to Japan. And uh, in grades 12 and 13, we had grade 13 up here back then. And so I took two trips. I went two months and four months. So six months in Japan, graduated from high school and said thank you very much to the talent rep at the modeling agency but i'm quitting this i'm going to university and he called a couple of weeks later and said can you act and i said i have no no idea and he said well cbs is casting this movie the week and you look perfect to play joe clayberg and tom Skerritt's daughter so go try and i did and i got the part and i thought it was just a one-off the summer between high school and university but then i got a lead in an independent film and then another lead. And then so I kept giving my tuition for university and getting it back and saying, well, I'll just do this one movie and then I'll go back to school. <laughs> and, wow. back to school. and that wow. continued for like two and a half years. And I was going to do my fifth lead. And I got into a car accident on the show. My set driver was leaving set and a car smashed into us. And I was in the hospital for three, three months and uh, about a year to recover. And, um, and I was oh. back in the movie business. Wow. Wow. So, that's wow. So <laughs> that's a, so so back up just a little bit. How long did it take you to break the shyness once you started all the modeling? 
I don't know. It was like I was kind of two personalities, you know, like I was really, really shy. But once I started actually modeling and doing go sees and jobs and stuff, it was sort of a thing that was mine. That was my own interest that my friends didn't have. And I could cut school without getting in trouble with the teachers because I had to go on a go see. Um, So I don't know. I don't know when I got over it. I just kind of got over it. But it was bad. It was like I had to go to the bathroom to calm down. If somebody would look at me when I was walking the halls in high school, I'd like want to. Oh, wow. Yeah, I was really, really, really shy. Wow. Wow. Okay. So what was your actual first, first job in the business? It was that. Yes, uh, movie of the week, Miles to Go. Oh, okay. So it was a film. Okay. So a lot of people say commercials or whatever. So it was no, that, it was that really uh, Tom Scarrett film. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It was a weird way to start. Oh, okay. And now, now, did you have heavy anxiety on the set with well established actors or did you break that pretty quick? I don't think so. I remember the big scene where. I had a little brother in it and where my mother, Jill Claybert is telling me and my little brother that she has cancer. Mm -hmm. And so I remember crying for her coverage and crying for my little brother's coverage. I was crying for hours and hours and hours. And then when it came time to do my coverage, the director tried to manipulate me, which I'm all for a director manipulating you, but just don't let you know, do you know, like, Uh, and he sort of bumped into me when he walked past me and like hit, you know, checked Mm. me. And I was like, what? And it really threw me and it was really kind of mean. And then I wasn't concentrating. Oh, wow. So it was like I couldn't focus. And so I remember the wardrobe and makeup people took me in the other room and they're like, just, he's just messing with you. Don't worry about it. So it took me a while to get back. Like, why would you do that? I was for hours crying for the other people. I can cry for you. I can be concentrated. I can be in character. But uh, anyway, he was uh, messing with me a bit and uh, I didn't like it. Like I said, I'm all for it. Go ahead, direct me. Go ahead and manipulate me, but just be really smart about it. Don't let me know. <laughs> <laughs> so, so tell us a little bit about one of your one of your first films, The Brain, which was a uh, quite an interesting uh, indie film that I, I actually revisited this week. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> I refer to The Brain as a comedy horror. Yes, because it's about this brain, this brain that grows to mammoth proportions and basically eats a town. And my friend is like eaten by the brain and how they did it was like, they put these two by four sticking out of his mouth, the brain's mouth with like pant legs and running shoes stuck on the end. And then the teeth are like rubber and wig. Like it was just absurd. <laughs> it was just ridiculous. So, um, the, but I think the director was serious. <laughs> hey, hey, I mean, those films, uh, even today are still, there's still um, millions of fans who love like the schlocky horror comedies or yeah. horrors. And so, hey, I mean, it's still, yeah, I'm it's sure it's embrace the genre. Like that's fine. Yeah. yeah. But, um, yeah. <laughs> so, so you've done a lot of TV, a mixture of TV, a lot of TV and films over your career. Like which, which medium did you always, did you find more comfortable over the, over the time of your career? Cause I know TV can be arduous with the, the amount of episodes and hours, but films for an amount of months can be as well. So, and even the soap opera dichotomy. So. Yeah, there's pros and cons to everything. Do you know, it's like, it's all equal. There's things I love and there are challenging things about all of them. Yes. I mean, the soap was heavenly because it was a steady job. Mm-hmm. And I'd had a steady job before, but like for nine months on Total Recall 2070. So this was two and a half years of a steady job. It was yeah. absolutely wonderful. But you were also working at this astounding pace that yeah. I thought would take me a few days to get used to. And then like maybe a few weeks to get used to. And three months in, I was still going, man, you guys shoot fast. Wow. It's just whiplash. It's so fast. And I hear because one of my you know best friends is still on you know Tamara Braun, and uh, she said they they work even faster. So it's just mental. Wow. wow. So if you see good performances on there, just take you know tip your hat, give them a round of applause because that is that's just amazing work. Absolutely, because a lot of people like uh, a lot of people sometimes demean so proper like actors for like almost as if it's inferior to film or other television work. And I'm like, look, when you hear the stories of the schedules and, and shooting multiple episodes per day and like a crazy amount of pages, like and it's of dialogue. Yeah, I used to have I studied at Playhouse West in L.A. And so I would have the teachers uh, make, make announcements in class to the other students to say anybody who wants to come on set and hang out with me to run lines in between 
every set, you know, not the setups when I'm on the stage, but if I've got like a down period or lunch or after work, I had to be running my lines all the time. Wow. wow. And I don't think you can even do that anymore. I don't think you can just like sign somebody on and have a guest on set. Well, certainly not with COVID, but I'm even pre -COVID. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, so speak a little bit about uh, Prom Night 3, which has found like a cult status too. That was kind of a spoof too of the first couple films. So. Spoof. Yeah, that was great. That was, that was really, really fun. Tim Conlon is a sweetie. I still uh, keep in touch with him on Instagram. <laughs> nice. Look at that curly hair there. <laughs> I had that for years. I used to perm my hair. And for so many years, that I, people would say they thought I actually had curly hair, like naturally. <laughs> um, Prom Night 3. Prom Night 3 was the first film I did back after my accident. So they had a walking double and a running double for me. So I just had to stand there and talk. Okay. Um, but that was really fun, like really fun. I remember Jeremy Ratchford played this nerd in it. And Jeremy, Ra Jeremy Ratchford was this big guy, really, really, you know, buff and always played the jock. So him playing the nerd, pushing up his glasses and his line delivery, I would ruin takes from laughing all the time. <laughs> and I don't know, we just all had a really good time. It was really fun. Awesome. So did you, so after the accident, did you have a, any difficulty with memorization or oh, yeah. anything? I mean, did you have to relearn kind of certain whole things? Ball, to whole new ball game. I used to read the script once or twice and know my lines and everybody else's lines. And after my accident, I had, I still have to, it's, I just have memory damage. You know, people mm -hmm. are always telling me about things that I did with them. And I say, no, I wasn't there. And they say, yeah, you were. And I go, no, I wasn't. They go, yeah, you were. And I go, oh, okay, it's one of those. So I have recreated memories where I picture that person and the thing they're describing. And that's a memory, but it's not an original memory. Uh, okay. Yeah, I have to work a lot harder. Gotcha. So gotcha. anybody can do it. Anybody can do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh so so what are some of what are some of your favorite cinema and actors that you followed coming up that uh that inspire you? I remember being so blown away by seeing Robin Wright on, what was that soap that she did? Santa Barbara. Santa Barbara, thank you very much. I was rocked like that, that, that is, that is so natural. And still to this day, when I see a kid or an actor that isn't famous yet, that's just so natural, mm -hmm. I'm like, they're just living. They're just being in the moment. Yeah. Don't get caught acting. Absolutely. It's like, yeah, Robin Wright really blew my socks off early on. Yeah. Phenomenal actress. Absolutely. So what about films? What about any cinema that, that you still watch to this day that, that you love? Oh, I have favorites from when I was a kid. Usually like things my dad liked, like uh, The Sting. I just loved that movie, you know, and TV shows like Quincy and, you know, yeah. Mash stuff that, you know, I was really little and there's a big armchair and my dad would snuggle me up in the armchair and we watch TV together. You know, like those are Absolutely. real sentimental favorites, but uh, yeah. Redford and Newman. All right. Classics, classics. All right. So you also had a small role in uh, a film that uh, one of our Indie Escape alum, Richard Greco starred in years ago called If Looks Could Kill. Uh, yeah. So how was that? You, did you shoot that in France? No, that was in uh, Montreal and Quebec. Oh, uh, okay. So long ago, it might have been Quebec City, but it was mm -hmm. Montreal. And I got a great roommate out of that. One of the other girls that played one of the classmates. Like I was a classmate. Richard Greco was a high school student who went on a class trip to, I guess, Paris. And somebody thought he was like a James Bond spy. And so then it becomes he's this pretending to be this spy. But we in the class got to be in the background all the time. So it was like three months of getting paid to be on set. It was the best deal. Um, and uh, Nancy McGifford then, Hillis now, was uh, my one of my castmates. And uh, she was talking about doing more acting. And I was like, you got to move to Toronto. Live with me. And we lived together for years. That was really nice. It was really fun. I had like the one line from the, um, the I guess it's like a, you know, featured background or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, I had one line. And I think they might have upped that and given me a couple of more. I think the director threw me a couple more lines. Awesome. But yeah, you usually have parts like that before you're doing like this big supporting lead in Miles to Go and then yeah. lead from. Like, when did I even do that movie? 
Oh, it was, was it was eighties. Yeah, yeah. It's in yeah. The problem, yeah. Because yeah. but that was yeah. Because it was after Jump Street, which yeah. Eighty nine to ninety two, I think Nancy was my roommate. Yeah, it was in that time frame. Right after Twenty One Jump Street went off the air around that time in Booker. So yeah. right. All right, so we have some comments. Ken McKeeran and says Canada rules. Awesome, thank you, Ken. Uh, Daniela, one of our other IE hosts, thanks for watching. Susie says, love them. Uh, Ken also says, Canada had a lot of great TV shows in the 80s and 90s, which you appeared in, Cindy. Mm hmm. <laughs> in and he says, yay for Montreal. Yeah. Uh, I shot a lot in Montreal in the old days. I shot a lot in Vancouver, too. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, so when did you when did you move to to Cali and like kind of get into the 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 rigmarole of Hollywood lifestyle out there for your acting career? I moved to LA in 1995. I shot a movie in '93 called Whale Music, mm -hmm. and it opened the Toronto Film Festival in '94, which is really cool. You're the opening night movie, so you've got all these big stars there. I remember Raul Julia walking up to me after going "Good job." And that was it. made my nice. day. And then the party down at Lake Ontario, run down there, you know, with this big tent, 5,000 people at the party. So it was a really big deal to be the opening movie. And then we were up for Best Picture that year. And we lost out to Exotica. But my co-star, Maury Chaikin, did uh, win Best Actor, deservedly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, so that got us a lot of attention. And I had three uh, agencies pursuing me and I was like no I'm a Canadian actor like I'm working why would I go somewhere where there's a million people that look just like me up here <laughs> if you can see five people I'm gonna in my age group I'm gonna be one of those five people so why would I do that and I kept saying no and then at one point for some reason it crossed my mind I just pictured somebody in the Midwest of USA going I would give my left arm to be represented by any one of these companies <laughs> maybe I can work both coasts I went down really thinking I would sort of split my time, but couldn't really do that. So I ended up picking um, Bressler, Kelly and Associates because they were Jack Nich Nicholson's agents. So I was like, well, if they're good enough for Jack. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so did so you, was, did you was, like the, did you like the Hollywood like way when you moved out there? I mean, you were out there for a while, but did you? I was there for 15 years. Yeah. Yeah. I was really lucky. I, I think there are a lot of deep, dark holes you can fall into. I yeah. think that you can think, oh, I'm going to go out and be seen in the clubs and be discovered. And that's just, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, but I had good representation. I saw Jeff Goldblum on a TV show talking about Playhouse West. He's one of the founding members. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't that far for me. And everything's really, really far in LA. So I was like, I'm going to go check that out. And so I went and um, audited one of their classes and it was incredible. It was just the first audit. It was like bells of truth were going on and things were being explained that I hadn't understood for years because I didn't study. Mm. I audited classes in Toronto, but somebody, I wish I remembered who, um, some work like working actor that I respected said to me early on, be careful who you study with because whatever you're doing is working. And so I was in Toronto, but I didn't devote myself to any school of study. And then when I went to this, you know, audit this class at Playhouse West, it was just like, oh, that's why that's been working. That's why that didn't work. Mm. I, remember, I would try, like I would swim fully. I remember doing um, some sitcom or small show here. I think it was called Cats and Dog. Mm -hmm. And there was a cop named Cats and he had a dog. <laughs> dog and i remember it feeling like a really different gear doing that show whatever i was doing felt different and i just went with it yeah and when i saw it and in the old days it was i don't know what nine months 14 months later that you would see it on tv and i was mm -hmm. like oh my god that's awful that's terrible <laughs> i didn't understand until years later i didn't have vocabulary for it so sitting in that class at playhouse west where they teach meisner um they talked about the difference between being and pretending and I was like, I was pretending on that. And I was just lucky that before that I had fallen into being, just living in the moment. And I just learned so much at Playhouse West. I studied there for like 12 years. Wow, wow. And even my teachers that I love so much, Tracy and Mark Pellegrino, they taught um, an intensive in Paris in 2018 and offered me to come over as their 
example of the work as their teaching assistant. And I was like, absolutely, I'll follow you guys anywhere. And I got to do it for a month without being a student, without having that blockage of not wanting to be in my head, but still wanting to please, you know, yeah. and wanting to do it right. And I didn't experience that there because I was the example of how it works. So I, just, I don't know. It, and plus it had been years. It had been 10 years since I'd worked with them. So it was just so freeing. You couldn't do anything wrong. Like years earlier, uh, we had done uh, Hamlet at Playhouse West. And because mm -hmm. it wasn't a professional theater company, it's a school, we rehearsed that thing for a year before we put it up. So we were told it was like the clearest version of Hamlet. <laughs> and <laughs> Mark Reno, um, who you know from like Supernatural and Lost. Yeah and all these great shows, played Hamlet and I played Ophelia. And so when I was in Paris, we re revisited one of the scenes. And just being back in that environment of, you can't do anything wrong as long as it's truthful. So it didn't matter if I came in and started the scene and I was bawling my eyes out or if I was frozen with fear. Like it didn't matter if I was crying or not. All that mattered was being honest. Like you just can't go wrong. If you're being honest, if you're just yeah. living the truth of it for you. Anyway, it refilled my gas tank. I had the best time. Awesome. 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 So, so you never did, uh, you were lucky in, in not having to deal with any sleazy producers or any casting couches or anything in your, in your time in LA, like, like unfortunately yeah. has happened meant to many actors and actresses in, in the business. I can't think of an LA situation right now, but I can think my second movie was, not a great experience. It was my first lead, right? So it was the first time I did a movie after Miles to Go. And I, as I mentioned to you before, the, I didn't talk about this stuff for ages, but now it's like, forget it. Don't, who are you protecting? It's just stupid. So anyway, the director on that kept asking me out. And when I would say no, he would be horrible to the crew. And mm. So finally, for everybody's sake, it was New Year's and he asked me, and I said, okay, fine. And he said, fine, pack a bag, we're going to New York. And I was like, no, no, like if I'm in New York with this guy, I can't call my dad. Like I was living on my own at that point. I had actually just recently moved out to my first apartment, but I could still mm -hmm. call my dad if something went wrong. Mm -hmm. We didn't have cell phones, but I could have found a pay phone. Um, but that was my thing. It was like, there's, there's just no way. And I remember, so I didn't go. But I remember him being a jerk on set one time and I had a fear meltdown and we were shooting in these really, it was really low budget, which is fine. I don't care about that. But we were shooting in this place and I remember being in this dingy, disgusting basement of some warehouse and I was in the bathroom with the door closed because I was crying and freaking out about this director and my co-star was knocking at the door going, Cindy, he's just a man. Like, I really let that guy get to me. And finally, my co-star, what's his name? It was either he played Tony or his name was Tony. Um, and he calmed me down and I finally went up and, you know, finished the night's shooting. But that was, I was, you know, I was a kid. I wasn't equipped yeah. to deal with that. And I didn't have mentors in the business because it was also new for me. Yeah, yeah. You know, so when I work with, you know, teenage girls or whatever, I'm like, okay, we're friends now. You call me whenever you have questions. I'm going to tell you about this experience that I want you to look out for. I'm going to tell you about this experience. And we can get into those later because, like, the advice that I want to Yeah, do. yeah, that's, yeah, definitely ask you at the end for that, definitely. Yeah, so there, I mean, that's the one example that springs to mind. I mean, there was another where this, was he a director or a producer? I think he was a director. And I can't even remember his name right now. And I was, I was naive. I, you know, was hanging out with him. It was like, oh, he wants to go out for dinner. He wants to have a drink. Oh, cool. You know, he's just being like yeah. you know, collegial with me and going to his hotel room again, really naive and just to have a drink. Like we're just talking. And at one point he walked over to me and like put his hand on top of my head and pushed me down to my knees. Mm. And I just went, no not happening and walked out now fortunately he wasn't an aggressive person he thought i was in you know which i get mm -hmm. clearly it didn't look like i wasn't but i just thought oh this is just us being friends you know um so that was a, a wake-up call mm -hmm. we learn. We learn. but i'm really lucky that he wasn't 
Yeah, yeah, like super aggressive. Yeah, like uh, it's a, these are cautionary tales. That's why I yeah. asked the questions, not for dirt, but yeah. again, for young actors and actresses yeah. out there to do your due diligence on the people that you work with. And yeah. again, a lot of times with, yeah, go, go in public. You know, yeah. go be friends, be mm. re develop relationships. It's a wonderful business. For a long time, I didn't develop the friendship relationships, even when we become friends on set, because if the actor was higher on the ladder for me or the director, the producers, I didn't want to look like I was like trying to benefit myself. Yeah. But we were already friends, but I would, I would go too far the other way and let that friendship that had developed completely go away. So now another reason I say to people, okay, we've now chatted, even if it's one conversation, we're friends, you know, yeah. we're obviously not close friends, but we're friends. You can call yeah. me, you can text me, you can reach out. Like Absolutely. it's an open door. Absolutely. All right. Sean Smith sent a friend to the show says directors like that are disgusting. Sorry. You had to go through that. Thanks. Sean. Uh, all right. TK Henderson, uh, one of the co-hosts of the black filmmakers lounge podcast on Saturday mornings. Thanks for showing. She said, that's crazy, which I concur. And uh, Lynn Oldfield show Shaw said, hi, Cindy. Oh, hi. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, thanks you for sharing that. All right. So as we move on, tell us, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, tell us a little bit about Total Recall 2070. Uh, you starred in that show opposite Michael Easton, who we talked about a little before the show. Right. And uh, how did that all come about? And how was that process being a part of like a big kind of sci-fi-ish type show? Oh, I loved that. That was something I auditioned for in Vancouver. I was shooting in Vancouver and... Um, that just to go into another aspect of it that we didn't really ask about, but sort of cautionary, um, my LA agent and my Toronto agent had gotten me auditions for that while I was mm -hmm. in Vancouver. And they had said that the line would be really clear and I would never be put in the middle of deciding who gets commission, mm -hmm. you know, because if it was a Toronto thing, it was going to be this and if it was LA, you know, and it was Vancouver. So it was kind of neutral ground. They both got me the audition. And so it was up to me to make that choice. And I chose to give it to my Toronto agent who I was really close friends with. And I, you know, friendship wise, couldn't say no, cause she was a little bit, I'm guessing now. I think she was sort of like, don't tell me that I don't know how to do my job to the LA agent. But actually the LA agent could have played bad cop. Because my LA agent was saying, like, we could have gotten more money for that. Like, that's not enough money. And so looking back on it later, I would say, look, you guys said you weren't putting me in the middle. You're splitting commission. That's all there is to it. That's what I learned from that. Because I made the mistake, you know, because I probably offended my LA agent, which is really stupid. But I didn't see that at the time. I just went with loyalty. You know what I mean? It was mm -hmm. so this show, so I auditioned out there. Um... There was a chemistry test. Do we all know what a chemistry test is when they read you with other actors? Yes. See mm -hmm. who's got chemistry. And I'm, there was a chemistry test. I think that was in LA uh, with Michael. And then I got the part. And I was living in LA, but it was shot in Toronto. So that was 98, 99, nine months to shoot that. I'd moved down to LA in 95. So it was like I'd never moved away. They, you know, they put me up in a condo in Toronto and Back I was. So I loved, loved, loved doing that show. It was based on um, Philip K. Dick's work. And I don't know if this is true or not, but I was told at one point that each of the episodes was based on another short story by Philip K. Dick. Not sure about the validity of that, but it was beautiful. Like the costumes, the set deck, it was just, it was Total Recall and Blade Runner. You know, yeah. it looks like Blade Runner, but the story was total, like a sort of a... Yeah of total recall and it was just so beautiful and my memory's really damaged so a lot of the stuff i don't remember i'm not sure like names won't come to me but i think universal maybe was the primary backer and no so our primary backer was bought out maybe by universal whatever they, they ditch all non-original programming so i don't think we weren't renewed after the first season because they didn't like the show and we didn't have good ratings it was just somebody else bought out this other company. It was like corporate. It was a buyout. Oh. It wasn't about our show. The whole company was bought out and they just ditched all unoriginal programming. Oh, okay. It wasn't theirs, the new company. So anyway, that was my understanding at the time. And again, I wasn't producing it, so I don't have all the inside. Yeah. So 
But I, I know they did keep those sets up for a couple of years, I was told, again, hearsay, uh, trying <laughs> to get that show, you know, picked up by somebody else. Yeah. Because it, oh, it was a beautiful show. It was a great group of people. Um, Jeff King is one of the, I think he's a writer, producer, or both mm -hmm. on Umbrella Academy. Um, just lots of stuff. Lots yeah. of people. Definitely a show that deserved a better fate because it was, like you said, it was, it was a good show. It was a really good show yeah. that uh, definitely if it was if it was a different time and there was different yeah. things that happened, it would have had a longer shelf life. Yeah. So I have a question I'm going to go to from Ken, and then I will get to you, Clay, because I'm we're going to talk GH. Ken's question was, what was it like doing the movie Pin? I found that movie disturbing. Mm. I loved doing Pin. Sandy Sturm is the director. Uh, David Hewlett was my co-star, and Dave and I were roommates after that. We were just, you know, shooting the hoop, shooting the shooting the crap. And he <laughs> wanted to move out of where he is. I went. So anyway, we were roommate, roommates for about a year until my car accident, and then I had to move back in with my parents because I couldn't care for myself for about a year after that. So um, mm -hmm. um, shooting Pin was just amazing. Like the energy on set, Sandy Stern was a great director for us. Um, it was all really calm. It was fun. It was easy to be in the moment and emotional. Like I remember scenes where there's a scene where I was in the library reading up about my brother's condition, we'll just say without giving anything away. Although spoilers, please. It's <laughs> um, and just to sit there and just to, just to sit there and cry, just to, you know, it was just, heartbreaking it was beautiful i love that awesome awesome all right so uh 2002 to 2005 oh, you were cast i'm sorry you found it disturbing i hope it was <laughs> disturbing and enjoyable but <laughs> it's good that it was disturbing anyway so. yeah yeah you did hey the film did its job absolutely uh so uh 2002 to 2005 you were cast in a role that in my opinion, and millions of others, you knocked out of the park as Mob Queen yeah. Faith Roscoe on the popular soap opera General Hospital. Tell us about how this process came to you and how cool it was to play such a badass on TV every day. That was a joy. I loved that job so much. I'm glad it lasted as long as it did. Um, I found out when they killed me off from a couple different sources from the writers, they said, you were supposed to be here three weeks. Oh, wow. And they liked me, so they kept me for two and a half years. Uh, so that was a huge compliment. Now, um, I actually tested for another character on that. I tested for Summer, who was like oh. that was part of gold. And I tested with Tony Geary, mm. the infamous Luke. Legend, legend, yes. Um, I didn't get that job. I didn't get Summer, but they liked me, and they called me. After I found out I didn't get it, they called back and said, we're writing a character for you. And I was blown away. Nice. I remember sitting on my deck, which was in the Hollywood Hills on the backside of the Hollywood sign. It overlooked the valley. And I remember just looking out going, I have someone to thank. My life is about to change. And I have, so I don't even know who to thank. And I didn't know how short they had in mind. Because you sign over your life to them. You sign, I forget, a two-year contract or something. Yeah. And... And we would tell other people that were new, they'd be like, I'm going to buy a car, I'm going to buy this. I'm like, no, you don't know. You make the money first, put it in the bank, and then buy the thing. But I signed it to your contract. That doesn't matter. It just protects the studio. It doesn't protect the actor. They can let you go whenever they want. Mm -hmm. so, um, so, yeah, so they wrote Faith for me. I mean, what a shock. <laughs> I think it was just, there was a moment in the audition with Tony where I said something, and I was so pissed off in that moment. He said something like, you're playing it safe. And I turned on him and said something like, what if I am? Like, who are you to tell me not to play it safe? Nice. And I was like, really, that pushed a button in me, like, fuck off. Yes. I think it might have been that moment that got me that job. Um, yeah. I played Faith, and she was such a well-written character. I mean, she was a well-written sociopath. Like, I had to kill my grandmother because yeah. she wouldn't give me her mother. So there's a scene where I'm crying in the church going, you made me do this. If you've just given me your money. And she meant it. Like, I, I just, she was fun. Um, another thing that was interesting was on my very first day, I'm supposed to go down these stairs to, you know, confront or, you know, meet up with Carly and Sonny, which that Carly was my dear Tamara Braun. As I said, still one of my best friends. 
Phenomenal, and, phenomenal oh, actress. Yes. Sure. Yes, she's astounding. Two time Emmy, Emmy winner or three? Hmm, losing count. Um, okay, so I'm going down this huge staircase. And I remember thinking, okay, I gotta, I gotta be imposing. I gotta be scary. I gotta be serious. And then I thought, no, what is the really important thing I remember from my acting class was don't stuff what you're feeling. If it calls for you to cry and you feel like laughing, laugh. If it calls for you to laugh and feel like crying, cry. So I was having such a good time and I was so happy that I went, okay, how can I in incorporate this into my character? So I went, okay, Faith loves to just stick the knife in and turn it as she's talking to you. Mm -hmm. Obviously. Um, well, not always, but um, so I just went down and loved every second of messing with people and had a great time. And they started writing for that playfulness. So I would get, you know, in soap magazines, they would have the funny line of the week, mm -hmm. which was always Tony Geary. And I got quite a few funny lines of the week in that magazine. So nice. that, was, that was nice for me. It was just well written. It was written to, you know, for me and more and more for me and you know this natalia livingston is one of my best friends she played emily yeah, yeah. Uh, rick hurst rick hurst what a lovely guy i mean he and his wife donna and their kids i mean they just sort of adopted me and had me to like the kids school plays and nick and cameron they were little kids when i met them and then they were oh so we had um a new year celebration at natty's house Years later, after we were after the show, so Nick and Cameron are like grown up young 20s men at this point. Mm -hmm. and for some reason, it came up that I was the voice of Princess Zelda, and they were like, What? And they rolled up their sleeves and they had the Triforce of Wisdom tattoo <laughs> before they had the tattoos, and they never knew that I did the Zelda voice for the cartoon, not the video game. Yeah, and, and they had these tattoos, it was just oh, it was really cool. That's amazing. Great. That is amazing. I love, I love what you said about that in regards to the nuances with the characters because uh again that's what i love so much about that faith character because she there was times where she would just have the nervous laugh she'd be captive by sonny and jason but you would just break out the laugh like hey yeah, want to go for a roll in the hay or sure. like and just me and i'm saying so do i get a last meal how about a martini i bet you yeah. take an apple martini and that was actually um you know you're laughing nervously and crying yeah. And my ex-husband was in special effects and they had, I don't know why they used to do this, sometimes I don't know how often, had the show on in the shop when it, he worked for like Stan Winston and Rick Baker doing like the biggest special effects. Oh. And that show was on that day and one of his co-workers heard him say, heard me say Apple Martini and went, did she ad lib that for you? Because Kyle used to drink Apple Martinis and I, and I had. So it was really fun for me to have our buddies at his special effects shop noticed that I did that. And nice. I did it often. I was an extreme, I did it twice. When they, <laughs> twice that I can remember, no, three times. When they killed me off, they were wheeling me out covered in a sheet and I sat up and went, I'm not dead yet. Little Monty Python tribute, mm -hmm. pretty much better. And there was a scene when Jason is unconscious in a hospital bed and I am supposed to climb on top of him and kiss him and i think unbuckle his belt <laughs> and i'm wearing a white doctor smock because i'm in the hospital you know mm -hmm. in disguise and i had somebody from props get me a rubber snake and i put it under my smock pinned <laughs> with my arm so when i climbed on top of him and unbuckled his belt i pulled out this rubber snake and the whole <laughs> crew crack that. <laughs> you don't do that very often because you shoot fast and time is money and it's not very often that you get to mess around like that. So three times in two and a half. <laughs> that is awesome. All right. Clay Stevenson has a great question. Uh, Cynthia, when the writers at GH approached you with the idea of an interracial pairing with uh, Mufundo Morrison, Mufundo. did you have any apprehensions? Some actors in Hollywood are not always comfortable. No, not at all. Awesome. We're all, I mean, I used to sound like Susie Sunshine, but I was just like, we're, I mean, who knows what, I'm not saying I believe in reincarnation or what I don't, I don't particularly, but I think you just end up in the box, this body that you're born into, like you could be born into another body. Mm -hmm. And I, I said that at a very young age, it was, I was like, very Pollyanna. Um, 
it's, but it was always my attitude. It was like one person is not better than another person. And what we happen to look like, that's not, you get, don't get to take responsibility for that. That's just what happened. So who cares? I mean, if he'd been a jerk, I would have had a problem, but he was a lovely guy. Awesome. You know, I just wish that relationship had taken off better. I, I think Faith was really well written, but at that point, I didn't think, I don't know what they had in mind for that. I don't know if they had a real le lengthy yeah. storyline in mind for that and didn't like it or weren't writing it rich enough, but it didn't really take off. It wasn't that long lived. It was and the Justice Ward character, right? Ward. Mafundo and I both wanted it to go way longer than it did. I mean, oh, okay. that's how my memory of it. It was like, damn. This, this should have gone longer, but, but that was near the end when they were getting rid of faith. So it might've just been their plans for faith, you oh, know, okay. but they were, you know, that was when I was on the run. I had fallen off the, what was the, the bar on a boat that I owned with, with Luke? The haunted star the haunted star. Yeah. So there was, I don't even remember how it happened, but I had had to flee by jumping into the ocean and run for my life. And so, <laughs> yeah. so the faith look, of the always in black clothes and the big hair and the tons of makeup and the long red nails was gone for the end of it because I was in the water. So I was sort of committed to not being fake about it. Like it would be really yeah. natural makeup. So you can see in the pictures of me and Mafundo, it's all very, like I look like a whole different character. <laughs> you know, because the hair is not done. It was in a ponytail and it wasn't, you know, makeup, yeah. like whatever foundation, no makeup, makeup, um, cover your zits. And um, I just wish that had gone longer. I wish that we'd, I don't know. Had, I don't know what they wanted. I don't know. It's a good answer. It's a good answer. So uh, so now uh, we've reached uh, One Sentence of Silence, which is my weekly. Uh, I asked you a name of someone that you've worked with in the business, and you give me some words about them, good or bad. Uh -huh. And if you don't, if you stay silent, that means they suck. Oh, I get to say I don't remember or tell me who they were. Or something. Well, yeah, you get to say whatever it is you want to say. <laughs> All right. I'm going to start off with Polly Shore. Polly Shore. Oh, my God. That was pretty funny. That was pretty funny. So it's about Polly. Say something about Polly or the movie. Well, just something about Polly, like, like if, like, just again, I'll give, I'm going to throw out a name and then you can oh, give a couple Polly. lines about Polly them. That yeah. Stick that you see him doing, he does that shtick all the time. He doesn't let it go. We like before the movie, we went to a restaurant to have lunch and he was doing his shtick to the to the waitress. You know, it was just like it was it was really funny. <laughs> okay. All right. Charlie Sheen. Charlie Sheen was really nice and not that really nice, like not too nice. He um I did two and a half men with him. He IMDB be DB'd me and gave John Cryer crap for not remembering that he'd worked with me before. Because I did a guest spot on this other John Cryer show. And but my scenes weren't with one scene was with John. But anyway, so he was really nice to me and funny. And um, I gotta keep these answers shorter, right? No, no, that's fine. That's great. All right, next, uh, director Kimberly Pierce. Oh, Kimberly Pierce. Love her. Bow down. Um, I was very disappointed. I didn't know until the premiere that I was cut out, most of my scenes were cut. It was one scene left with Julianne Moore. Mm -hmm. um, and all the parental stuff, like, yeah. you know, people said to me after, well, where was the, the parents? Where was the this element? And I'm like, oh no, we shot that. We shot that conversation. Shot. So I'm sure the studio, uh, I don't know, went above Kimberly mm. and said, we're doing all of the explosions and we're not doing these parental moments. But um, it was such a treat. Working with Julianne Moore was such a treat. She was so nice. She was like, hi, I'm Julie. I'm like, hi, I'm Sue. <laughs> knew all the crew's names and, you know, goofed around with them in between takes and couldn't have been nicer. Awesome. The Highlander himself, Adrian Paul. Yes, Adrian Paul. Um, that was really fun. That movie was with uh, Christopher Lloyd. Um, and uh, that was, he was, they were just great. It was great. Um. Uh, Awesome. Do you want more? Do you want anecdotes? Do you just Any, want anything, yeah, anything, yeah. Exactly. If you have stories, share. I always just say some words, but sometimes people have interesting stories, so feel free to share anything. I just remember them both being amazing. And I and I remember I got to um, go into the editing room on that movie because I got uh, what was called? Uh, X-Files. <laughs> remember that mm -hmm. name? I got X-Files after I did that. So I was staying in Vancouver for a few weeks. So every day after I finished shooting X-Files, I would go to the editing room because I met the editor of our movie at the rap party. 
and actors never get to go in the editing room. And this guy was like, yeah, I'm down there alone now every night. And I was like, absolutely. So I'd be there. And this is in the old days when they were shooting on Avid and you had to load film. Mm -hmm. I remember the editor saying to me at one point, um, I wish you had turned here. It was, an, it was a scene with Christopher Lloyd in an alley. It was raining and umbrellas. And he's like, I wish you had turned to your right instead of your left because I could have used this tape and this tape. And I said, I know I did. And he's like, it's not in my scene. And then they didn't load it. So we loaded it up and it totally changed the course of the movie, you know, because it mm -hmm. was a really important scene. And I just learned a lot. Um, he was editing for continuity. And do you know what I mean? Like not, not yeah. for performance. And then yeah. when I flew back to LA, I sat beside the editors from X-Files. And I was like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I have questions for you guys. Cause I just was in the editing room with this and do you edit for continuity or for performance? And they said performance, absolutely for performance. And that's why you see stuff where the button is done up and then undone or you have a glass in your hand and then you don't because you go for performance. Cause not everybody's gonna notice if something, you know, continuity wise is off, but you're gonna feel the performance. So you don't, so and then I, you know, contacted the editor after and went, oh my God, I talked to these people. And, <laughs> and now I love, I love editing. I just. Awesome, awesome. All right, so uh, Sonny Corinthos himself, Maurice Bernard. Just a lovely man, charming, open, um, had us over for parties, his house, lovely family. Um, I didn't get super close to him because he was the imposing character. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you just form your different little groups of buddies and stuff. But he yeah. was always really nice to me. Great, great scene chemistry. And the next person I thought you had great scene chemistry too with in the same show, Steve Burton. Yep. Same thing. There was like that group of buddies that hang out. And Mafundo hung out with them, like outside mm -hmm. of set. And I hung out with Tamara and Natalia and... Mm -hmm. You know, it was just like you can't hang out with everybody. It doesn't mean yeah. they're, not, they're not nice. Yeah. But yeah, Mafundo was always hanging out with those guys. And that's, I mean, maybe Mafundo and, and I had hung out some more. Ugh. Is in the writing. Anyway, um, <laughs> uh, Steve, was, Steve was great with me. Um, again, just not a super close friend, whereas, you know, the other people we traveled to spend time together, you know. Awesome. All right. Uh, the late Howard Hessman. Yes, played my dad in a movie, in a comedy. Um, he's super nice, didn't get to know him really well, but very, very nice. But that, there's an anecdote from that movie, you never know what they're thinking in the room when you audition. Mm. So for that one, I had run the lines with one of my fellow students at Playhouse West, um, Val, lovely guy. And um, we would sit in my car outside of the class after class ended and run these lines and crack up. We, it was a comedy. So I'm, I'm reading for a lead in a comedy that shot at Sony. Like this was, mm. you know, um, so I really wanted to do well. And Val and I were cracking up like crazy. We thought it was funny. We thought we were hysterical. And so I drive down to the audition and they didn't crack a smile. They didn't <laughs> laugh. They gave me nothing. So when I was in class the next time, the teacher asked how it went because it's such a big audition. And I said, wasted the gas it took to get there, wasted the paper of my resume that I gave them. And then I get the part. And so next class I go back and it just shows you. You never know what they're thinking. I got the part. Nice. Yeah, it's so, true. You never know the impression you're making. Know. Yeah. All right. And finally, uh, Hawk Hogan. Uh, he was great. He was great. There were some snobby actors that said to me at the time, like, poor you, you have to work with Hulk Hogan. He's not an actor. And I said, he tries harder and is more sincere than a lot of the actors that I've worked with. Do you know, like if people come on with attitude and conceit and just think they're all that in a bag of chips, not as good. This guy was so into it and so focused and tried so hard. He was a total joy. He was so nice to his fans. I remember, I think it was when the drivers told me like he was driving Terry, is his name, um, yeah. to the airport. And there were a bunch of fans outside of location waiting to ask him for autographs. And even though he had a plane catch and he was tight for time, he stopped and signed all the autographs. And That's he was awesome. great to me. He was great to the fans. He was totally sincere in the moment, giving it everything in the scenes. And I have nothing but respect for him working in that movie. We didn't ever, you know, 
we're very, we have different lifestyles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. One friend. It's not somebody I call up or anything, um, <laughs> but uh, it was a good working environment. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you got through without to say, well, you got through. <laughs> Do you want me to tell you the cautionary tales now or later? We're almost later. <laughs> yeah, we're almost there. <laughs> Yeah. So uh, I wanted to bring up, actually, there's a couple couple people that text me. Ken asked, uh, said, Nev Campbell, uh, did you work with Nev? I did. But okay. something when we were so much younger, all I remember, because again, after my accident, I would remember things from photographs. Like I would have my photo albums dated from the state to the state. Like I had to, I had to, you know, make a, a visual record of my life because anyway, so I found a Polaroid at one point of me and Nev and another girl. And we had Catholic school girl skirts on, not sexy ones, long actual Catholic mm -hmm. school girl uniforms. And we had cigarettes and we were like, you know, mock smoking. Cause we were, I don't know what we were shooting, but it was something that we all just took some silly picture. So I don't remember what it was, but I remember mm -hmm. seeing this Polaroid of something, some episodic I did in Toronto. Oh, wow. So, okay, and I got a message uh, from someone that I asked, uh, Christopher Lloyd. Yes. Yes. Um, just a lovely man. He was, he was great. It was such a treat. He was such a star. You know, I, I watched Taxi. I watched Back to the Future. Yeah. It was such a treat to work with him. He was awesome. phenomenal. He was great. Awesome. The show was Catwalk, as Ken said. Oh my gosh. Who, wow. who just, did, did Joe just figure that out? Did no, you... uh, Ken McKernan, like one of the, one of the gentlemen watching in. Good job. <laughs> Oh, I do I remember that. that now. I do remember it was a short lived, like, child. I don't remember yeah. shooting it, but what I remember from that show was somebody on it. I think they had a coach because we were all teenagers. I think they yeah. had an acting coach for the kids. And if I was asked for more level, which is louder for those mm -hmm. not in business, um, yeah. you know, this coach told me this great thing don't think about being louder, think about being heard um emotionally intellectually think about being heard not yeah. audibly ah. and we will get it across and i was like whoa that's a big note. <laughs> that's, that's awesome a big note. yeah awesome uh yeah so all right so you got through without uh silence so you you made it through uh, only two people have stayed silent in my 20 episodes so so you're not on that list uh so uh moving forward tell us a little bit about it was mentioned earlier but tell us a little bit about the uh playing the voice of uh of uh princess zelda and the print and uh the, the legend of zelda oh it was so much fun i don't know why it was more fun I mean, there's the obvious reasons that you don't have to do hair and makeup and it doesn't matter what you look like. <laughs> you don't have to memorize stuff because you're standing in front of a stand with your lines on it and a microphone in front of you. And you may or may not be with the other people in the scene. Usually Jonathan Potts, who played Link, who I'm still friends with. Um, we were usually in the room together and only once or twice did I get to see like Len Carlson or playing Gannon, like the other guys that did creature voices that blew my mind watching the dexterity of their voices, the things they could do. Um, but it was just so much fun. I don't know why we had a blast. We would laugh so much. One time I wasn't laughing enough or I was laughed out. So the director mooned me from the booth. And that was pretty damn funny. So anyway, I don't know. We just had a great time. Awesome. Awesome. So aside from acting, you, uh, you honed your skills over the years as a director, a writer, an editor that you mentioned. What do those those specific duties do for you personally as a creative? I love every aspect of this business and creativity and all that stuff. And um, it was um, 2014. I had taken different writing courses. I did. A, I, I wrote a, a feature started in 2014 and kept rewriting it. They say it's never finished, it's only abandoned. I don't know who that quote is from. I can't think of it right now. But, um, I took it to Banff a couple of times to the pitch festivals there, the Banff Media Festival. And um, just around the same time, 2014, I found a book that I thought would make a great movie. So I pitched it for eight months. My manager and I pitched it for eight months to every producer and director that I could get a hold of that I had worked with. And finally one of them picked it up and it was made into a movie for lifetime. So this movie was made of a book 
that wouldn't have been made into a book. Now the book was written by my niece, but that doesn't matter. That's how I found, you know, the galleys. Um, but it was this really cool memoir and Lifetime picked it up and made a movie out of it. So obviously they thought it was really interesting too. Um, and I love the process of pitching. I love the process of having some more control than just waiting to be picked. Um, at the beginning of COVID, a friend of mine who runs a nonprofit in Boston asked me to edit some shorts for their company. So they weren't narrative shorts. They were in this amazing program called Writers Without Margins. And they do uh, writing programs, classes with people transitioning out of prison, people in like um, homeless shelters, I believe, and drug addiction centers and all these people in marginalized communities mm -hmm. and how creative writing helps people. Like there are studies, one of the videos that I edited is this doctor, I think, um, who said there's been studies all over the world in different languages. It's not just in English that this happens, but when you write, when you free, freely write, like without even looking, without expecting anyone to look at it, it's good for your health. You know, like you, they did studies of university students and they're actually healthy, they, they're healthier, they go to the doctor less, people that write creatively and freely. So anyway, I got into editing with that and I edited, I learned how to edit because when I came back from Paris, I had to edit the um, scenes that I, scene that I had directed for the students there. And at the same time, total re, um, Jack Ryan had come out and I did nudity in Jack Ryan. So I didn't want to work with an editor to cut out my nudity for my demo. I wanted to edit it myself because yeah. I don't want to go, okay, have a second before the boob show, you know, I just wanted to do it myself. And so I edited out the nudity and so I learned how to edit. So it's just, I love the editing. I love that I went down to Atlanta on a project with Natalia Livingston and co-directed a feature, or not a feature, a short. And um, that was a really interesting thing because we, this feature film was written and different actors got to direct different scenes and be in different scenes than they directed. And then there were scenes that weren't filmed. So we put it up on stage in Atlanta. So you got to watch some live scenes and some shot scenes. So we watched the feature by the time it was done, but it was live and taped. It was just a really amazing experience that Natalia Livingston put together with her creative partners out there. Nice, so, nice. Yeah, so I, love of it. I loved the directing. Like it was like, it didn't matter what I looked like, but I got to play in the sandbox. Yeah. You know, so I just want to write shorts and direct them. Now I don't have illusions of going on and directing like Hannibal was shooting here or things like that and managing the crew. But what I've learned from working 36 years on set is that I can do that, you know, and I took a directing course, you know, like when COVID hit, I also took a writing course, acting course, directing course, producing course with a lot here has this online film school called independent film school. So I basically went to film school when we were in shutdown, which led to uh, being in a writing group there and started working on a feature with two of the women I met in that writing group, which leads me to my next projects when you want to talk about them. Awesome. Well, I wanted to uh, talk real quick about uh, Mute, which won a bunch of awards for you that you wrote in your end. Can you talk a little bit it. about that? I didn't write it. I produced it. Okay. You produced right. it. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Constant Hilton directed it and she was a sound engineer on a lot of shows in Toronto. Okay. And um, Dave Senior Jr. also was like the line producer, producer and had worked on a lot of shows in Toronto and they came to me uh, because um, Alana Power is a camera person who I'd worked with on different shows and Alana was their DP and she said, I know who you should get the lead in this. And Dave had also worked as an assistant at my agency, so he knew my agent. And so they brought me in for a meeting with Dave and um, I read this short, it was by Stephen King and they swapped the genders. The the lead in the short story mm -hmm. is a man. And um, they brought me on as producer so that I could make it an actra deal. So that was great because it demystified the process. Because it's kind mm -hmm. of like, how do we make it union? It's like, yeah. no, you fill out the papers. And if you do something wrong, they write to you and go, you can't say that. You have to say this, this, or this. And you go, oh, oh great, I'll say this. You know, like Connie was on the line as director, producer, writer, because she wrote the adaptation. 
And they said, because she's not in the union, this is the acting union, so she can only have one credit, whereas you can be lead performer producer. And so mm. we're like, oh, you change this. So it was like, hold your hand, they demystify the process. It's not scary. Go ahead and call them up and they'll help you. You know, it was mm. great. Awesome. Awesome. So what is Syndicate VR Productions Corp? That is the aforementioned Dave Senior Jr. Okay, how you got involved with this? Um, a friend from grade school had reconnected with me on Facebook mm -hmm. and said, "Hey, my buddy's daughter works at TIFF and she wants to be. A, she's an aspiring writer. Will you talk to her?" I said, "Of course I will." I had a chat with her. Her name is Caitlin Garvey, and um, I read the shorts that she sent me. Two shorts, and I was blown away. And I said, I want to produce these and direct these. And she said, great. And I called up Dave Sr. And said, are these, this? well, no, I called him to say, how did you raise money for mute? Because I want to do these shorts. <laughs> and um, in the conversation, during the conversation, he said, do you want me to take a look at them and read them? And I said, sure. And he called me back and said, these are as special as you think they are. I want to be involved. So we got on a video chat with the three of us, me and David, Dave and Caitlin, and started making our big plans. And um, uh, one of the shorts, Dave, because he also worked at Ubisoft as well as working on a lot of film productions, he said, you know, narrative VR, a VR experience, not a game, is like the new thing. And we should make one of these shorts of Caitlin's as a VR experience. And I said, well, I know somebody in Vancouver that works in VR. But they're not in entertainment VR. They had like commercials and oh. floor companies. You can be in a room and try on different floors and I don't and other things too, but not creative entertainment stuff. Um, and so I called her up and she pitched it to the rest of her team, which is international. They've got people in a British guy in Poland and a Ukrainian guy in Germany and you know, people all over the place. And um, they really liked the idea of working with us. But the short that we brought to them was actually a little too dark. So Caitlin came up with another idea and we developed this other idea, the three of us for them. And it just kept going and going and going and they loved us. And then we pivoted from that project because we're not forgetting this project because there's this other project that I can't name, but it's, you would recognize the name of the organization if I said it. Ah, okay. It's known. <laughs> and so we were brought in, they liked what we were doing in this other project and they were like, it, it, we've got to have this team. We, me and Dave and Caitlin were jokingly calling ourselves, not jokingly, but not officially calling ourselves syndicate. We said, we're not a production um, team. We're not incorporated, but we will be someday if we want to be, if it works for us. Um, and so syndicate with a C. So Cindy, Dave and Caitlin, so syndicate productions. Um, so we're working now, like, so we're developing these two VR projects with this big team, uh, international team, and it's, it's moving along. We have pre-production funded and we are paying people. Wow. Um, and that's what I was up all night doing the voices for act one, two, and three of our demo and another slide deck. And then, you know, 12 hours to do the voices and edit and it just takes that long. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> you, like I said, when you said you were up uh, just finishing work at 5 a.m., you are a warrior, definitely, Because, yeah. but that's what it takes. That's what yeah. it takes. It was something like 6.59 p.m. to 6.34 a.m. <laughs> they shut off the computer and then had to, you know, render them and send them. So it even took longer. You know, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, I was very punchy, still feel a bit punchy today. Uh, it takes a while to catch up when you absolutely, absolutely. that way. So our, one of our weekly questions, if you could play any role in any film, doesn't matter the budget, what would that type of film be and what would the role be? I don't know. If I have an answer for that, I don't remember. I know that I want to play. I want to create stuff. I want to direct. I want to just, you know, work with a great first AD and a great DP and say, okay. I mean, the director's job is a lot of it is putting out fires. It's like, okay, we thought we could have this. We had this location. We can't have this. What are we going to do now? Um, or here's how I see it in my mind. What can I actually have to the DP? And he'll maybe give me like three options and I'll go, okay, I pick that one. Like just, just to create with other people. You know, I just love it. I mean, with the thing that I directed in Atlanta, I remember they, they were sending me tapes of the rehearsals because I couldn't be there. 
Mm -hmm. um, sending me tapes or I was watching on Zoom. I can't remember. But anyway, with one of the actors, I was thinking, wow, I'm really going to have to reel him in when I get there. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, when I got there, I just let him fly because I see my job as supporting them and nudging. Mm -hmm. you know? And he had worked it out. What he was doing was experimenting. Yeah, and okay. by the time we got to set, what he was doing was totally clicking. You know, it was totally working. Yeah. And my job was just like, okay, this one guy who was less experienced, you've got to sit on this line or I can't cut it. You've got to sit on this exact line. You have to sit here. You have to stand here. Other than that, do what you want to do. And like with, there was a teenage girl in it and um, she did one take as if she was like all that and sassy and the bag of chips and all that. And I was like, give me more of that. Like I gave her permission. Yeah. To be sassier because I mean she might have been shy or embarrassed about it and yeah. I don't know what it took her to be that sassy in that one take but I'm like give me more yeah give Absolutely. me more of that. So, it's like that casting director that that said that to you <laughs> it's, it's the same what, thing what are you referring to so when you said earlier about the casting director that said like uh be a little bit more and you're like what if I'm not the faith audition it's oh, like it's almost like oh, that. Oh, sorry, because that was my acting school stuff. That was once I had the job. Yeah. And I was there. Yeah, that was my acting teacher said that stuff. Sorry. No problem. I'll say I have a question. Uh, Ken again, uh, what's your favorite role? I liked you in whale music. Mm. Thank you very much. Well, that was a big favorite. I mean, it changed my life. Uh, it brought me my offers of representation. I moved to LA and got married and <laughs> You know, had a whole life there. Um, that was a big one. But that was one where it was really interesting because I was in an abusive relationship at that time. And I was going to set and not telling anybody what I was going through because I didn't want to be that problematic actress. Um, I got to use the term actor. My first agent called all us females actors. I thought actress was an old Hollywood starlet term. And not to criticize anyone who uses it, but I... Um, I didn't tell anyone because I didn't want to be a problem. And my driver, who was a woman, finally went to the producers and said, it feels weird just jumping into this because you and I talked about this on the phone the other day, so mm -hmm. it seemed okay for me to talk about this. But anyway, it's fine. Um, my driver went to the producers and said, she doesn't say anything, but she gets more and more scared or tense or something as we get closer to the hotel. And she was right. And the producers came to me and said, uh, we don't want to pry but do you want to switch hotels? We, and, and I was like, pause, like, I don't know. I don't know how that gets And They said, we can put you under an assumed name. And I said, yes. And they switched hotels, put me under an assumed name. Some friends of mine who I had visited while, while I was there, I didn't tell them anything either. They happened to come to set. It was weird. I saw it in a movie. I wouldn't believe it. They came to set the same day and said, we don't know what's going on with you. Something's going on. And I said, you can't, you can't, you don't understand. He's dangerous. He's violent. Um, and they went, we're going to your hotel room and we're getting your stuff. And I even, I was crazy. I was traveling with my cats at that point. I, and so they went, they got my cats, they got my stuff, they got everything except the last few things. And then at one point they looked at each other, I'm told and went, yeah, he's getting weird. Let's go. And they just like left the rest of the stuff. Um, mm -hmm. so what, do, what, what can I say? I don't know. I, if I, you can't say I would do it differently. Like he, this abusive person had said, if you go to the police, I'll kill your parents. I know where they live. And I had seen him. He was very physically fit and very agile. And I thought if anybody can get away, like you hear about police, people getting away from police, or you hear about people being arrested and then being released. Mm. Mm. And in my mind, I had made him omnipotent. He was so, I was completely vulnerable and he was so powerful. Mm -hmm. And I li I'd like to think that now I would say, you can swear on this thing, fuck you, mm -hmm. and walk into a police station and say, I'm in danger, I can't go back. But I don't know, I don't know, I can't, you, you, I don't want to put anybody in a dangerous situation by saying do that. I just yeah. wish that I had kind, of, okay, I'll just say I wish I had done it because Don't let anybody, they don't have that power over you. I thought I was powerless. And I could have, actually, whether or not it would be a good idea, I can't say. I could have at any point walked into a police station. I was not powerless. It's a very tricky, very tricky situation. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you for thank you for being open about that. I know, like I said, I know you shared that on the phone when we spoke. But uh, but yeah, for any any young actress out there that uh, that might hear that, that may help them to 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 be able to say anybody to to step up and uh say something. And props to those producers for yeah. for doing that because that's uh, uh, my whoever, driver, yeah. that woman and the driver. Yes, absolutely. Because that's uh, yeah. you don't always have crews that have your back yeah. like that. So that's that was props to whoever they were leads into the experience of one of the projects I'm writing with uh, the wonderful Rob Stewart, who is an actor, director, producer. Mm -hmm. And um, so I'm writing with Andy and Akiva. Andy's in New York and Akiva's in Texas. And we meet three times a week and we're writing a horror movie. Mm -hmm. And with Rob, I'm writing a series. And it's about this woman who's a therapist. And if someone comes to her, male or female, and they're in an abusive relationship, me and Rob are writing it for ourselves. We take revenge. <laughs> Oh, I like it. And we take revenge on these abusive people. So it's kind of. Um, <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, John Smithson has a question. Uh, is there a role you wish you had auditioned for or landed? There's one story that comes to mind. I had a friend, like sort of a work friend, a distant friend, but somebody that I, you know, liked. Um, and he worked at Alliance Atlantis when we made whale music and we stayed in touch. And anyway, he was in Vancouver and he was going to be directing, Mark Forby is his name. He was gonna be directing a movie with Ben Kingsley. And it came out over the breakdowns like my manager had sent it to me. And I, oh, the director is a like work friend of mine. And so I wrote him an email and I was like, hey, I see this breakdown and it totally describes me. <laughs> and I'd love to audition for you. And, you know, work with Ben Kingsley. And he wrote back and said, hey, Cindy, yeah, um, sort of tell you, but the studio is kind of thinking of Gwyneth Paltrow for this. And I was like, oh, yeah, 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 I get it. <laughs> if I'm producing, I want the big name, too. So that's business. You know, it happens all the time. I mean, yeah. I read for something recently. I had, I did the audition, self-tape everything now with COVID, which I love. Uh, love not having to drive into the city to do the auditions and um oh i got that uh jack ryan with a self-tape and a self-tape callback so that's interesting. um so anyway did an audition for a new series recently and the callbacks were coming up they were going to be zoom callbacks so not a self-tape and the director was in asia and he wanted to talk to the finalists so we had a um a chat before the callback mm -hmm. and then did the callback really <laughs> found a system that works for me. Um, rehearsed it over and over and over again with different people. And what the one person, one of my writing partners I rehearsed with right up until the Zoom callback. So I wasn't here sitting here nervous. I wasn't thinking about me. I was always thinking about what my character's doing. I'm so relaxed. I was so, so relaxed. It was such a success for me because it was so relaxed. So anyway, um, the director, the casting director after said the director was raving about you. You did a great job. You did a really good job. So real success for me. But casting director wrote back when my manager and agent pursued it, you know, like, is it cast yet? Does Cindy get the part? And they went in italic. She's not out of it yet, but the studio wants a name. So my oh. whole career, I didn't even work up to this because I fell into it accidentally, you know, because I fell into the business. I didn't aspire like this you know, modeling agent had said, try. So I was doing big parts right away. And as we've gone over, there were smaller parts too, but that's because you do everything. Um, but <sighs> I just lost <laughs> my train of thought. Why did I do that? What was I talking about? <laughs> no, you you did that. Uh, that they they said they wanted a name, which is ludicrous. Oh, but again, that happens all the time. Exactly. Unfortunately, I'm auditioning yeah. for stuff all the time that goes to a name. Yeah, so I can't even remember. It's been my whole career. <laughs> you know, like I've always been lucky that I've been in that top group of people that get seen. Yeah. So I have the opportunity to maybe get it. But if there's yeah. a bigger name, it's just good business. Yeah. I mean, I just want a director someday to just go. No, it's got to be her. She's a big enough name. As I'm a small baby. <laughs> um yeah so but you know it's just it just gives the project more legitimacy if you can get a really well-known household name and i made i'm known by a few people <laughs> it's, it's true but uh, i like i'd like to err on the side of like good people and just amazing talent which you are so so but that there's a that's... Lot of talent out there so there's so much luck involved in this 
business. Absolutely. You know, preparation meets opportunity. Like just work hard, prepare. Absolutely. But it's so, so much luck. <laughs> absolutely. So uh, one of our final questions uh, is kind of uh, words of advice and good or bad. Like, again, a lot of our guests have given cautionary tales. Some of them have given. If, it, if you're not 1,000% in it, walk away, do something easier. Some people have given uplifting things. So you can say whatever you want. The floor is yours. But as I told you before the show, there's a lot of uh, inspiring actresses and actors and filmmakers and professionals that watch on. So uh, please just share some words of wisdom for them, please. It is a hard job. It, it is constant rejection. And you don't usually make enough to live off of. So it is a, it is a hard life emotionally and it's a hard life practically, but if you, if you want to be an actor, don't do it to be famous, go work in community theater, go take classes, go create your own stuff in this day and age. Are you kidding me? Write your own stuff and shoot it on a phone and put it in iPhone festivals. You know, it's like there's nothing stopping you. Back like in my day, you couldn't do that. I mean, there were you hear about the people with the super eights. I wasn't really. But anyway, yeah, <laughs> do it. But I'm I'm a big um, proponent of also going to school and you know become a lawyer and also do this. You know, um, but the things I I like to pass on to young people are if you have something in your contract that you're not going to show physically, like nudity. Like on Total Recall 2070, I had a body double for the nudity for the European version. But sometimes the pasties, which were just like sticky bra cups they put on you, it is a marathon shooting this stuff and you're hot and you're sweating and it doesn't matter. And the wardrobe people are rushing in with a robe every time they say cut and it takes three seconds to reset. And so just, just okay, we're all adults here. They're boob, boob, elbow, who cares? Do you know? But they used one of my, like it was a shot of me and Michael, I think we were in a shower and I was leaning back against him. He saw us from behind. So you see him, you see me and you saw like side of my body and I'm like, huh, and that's me. So I say, if you're, if you've got a body double or you say no nudity, you take really sticky black gaffer tape and put an X over your boob. And on the other one, on that Hulk Hogan one, the director mm -hmm. came in and said, oh, it's gonna be like a family movie. We're gonna take out most of the swearing. And, you know, I don't know if he said you can trust me, but I thought he said you can trust me. And I'm playing a stripper, but I'm not even going down to the equivalent of a bikini. You know, like in that shot, that's the mm -hmm. stripper. Up there. I'm wearing mm -hmm. this leather thing with a lace here and a leather mini skirt. And we were shooting and we're on a stage and the camera's down below on the floor and they're shooting up and I'm sort of shimmying down the pole looking over my shoulder. And I'm thinking for sure they're getting the over the shoulder shot of my face here, right? Mm -hmm. Like there's no way they're shooting at my skirt. This wouldn't happen in this day and age with intimacy coordinators on set. Because the intimacy coordinator would see the shot and go, no. Because I always used to say, you know, show me the shot too. You can't tell what they're going to zoom in on. Yeah. When I, I would go check the frame, not to protect myself, but to see what we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I saw that when... Um, it was on TV and that was very upsetting because it was really, really rude. It was like I was wearing a G-string underwear but it was my butt cheeks were basically showing. And it was just rude and not to be told or asked, are you kidding me? Yeah. So I would now write in markers, fuck you across my butt, you know, or tape or yeah. not wear G-string underwear since you don't get to see my butt, you know, like, yeah. Wear granny panties, or I don't even know, but just don't <laughs> give them the opportunity yeah. because yeah. If, they have, if they have the opportunity, they'll use it. Yeah. So those are those are my words. There you go. There you go. The yeah. Cautionary tale there. Like you never yeah. know what's yeah. what's yeah. being yeah. shot. It doesn't matter what your contract says. It doesn't matter that I had a body double for nudity. And yeah. you're over a barrel. I mean, maybe it could have made a fuss, but you also feel like, well, I want to work again. And this is the biggest film company in Canada that I know of. It was Alliance Atlantis at the time. Mm -hmm. no, it wasn't it was a different company and mixing those up. Doesn't matter. I didn't feel like I had the power to say anything. And another thing, if you're in a real, this is getting into relationship advice. Oh, this is bad. Um, say it. If it's your problem. Like I didn't tell my husband at the time. He's my ex-husband now. Um, I didn't tell him about this. Cause I was like, well, he's not gonna like, he's not gonna like it anymore. And I liked it, but I should have said it. 
when it was my problem we were dealing with. Because he saw it on TV months later with his friends, so he was embarrassed, and came down and he was upset. And then we were dealing with his upset. Mm, so now yeah. my relationship with Sean, who I've been with for 12 years, if I, if I think of something I don't want to tell him, I tell him as fast as possible. And yeah. it is the lightest relationship I've ever had. Because it's like, whatever I'm telling you is real. So why present a shiny version of myself? Absolutely. Do you know, like take me or leave me for who I really am. I don't want to be accepted for something you think I am, then I'm not. And I ask you to respect me and do the same. Show me who you really are. And it is just the best, lightest relationship. We get along so great because we just, there's, I mean, there's no secrets. I mean, it doesn't mean I have to tell him everything I ever did in my entire life, but just, it's just be yourself. Love yourself, accept yourself, be yourself, be accepted for who you are or that person that, love interest that friend we're both these like, imperfect human beings just trying to get along maybe that's not the right imperfect human being for you to be friends with you know <laughs> you know what i mean absolutely or they were for a while and now they're not like who knows great advice great industry advice and great re relationship advice be honest and be honest at the right time because like you said honesty a little bit too late can mess things up yeah. just as bad so and i've heard it said that you know lying doesn't just hurt relationship it hurts you like physically and it's like not healthy yeah it's it's such a better place to live to go i am enough i didn't feel like enough i had i terrible i'm not worthy i still have them negotiating contracts on the vr thing is pushing all my i'm not worthy buttons because i've never mm -hmm. had to negotiate my own contracts before because now i'm doing it as a producer yeah and oh well of course i'm going to do the voice stuff and something i'm developing are you kidding like mm -hmm. you know so it's a lot of terrain that i haven't <laughs> traveled before and it's tough but it's i'm a lot. Yeah. learning i think i'm discovering what i'm going through and why i'm feeling so weird and yeah it's just just work at it just work at it you're enough you're enough whatever it is you're enough you're enough absolutely absolutely mr ridgely uh any questions for uh cindy I could probably go on for another hour and a <laughs> half, but I'm not going to <laughs> because I respect her time. But this was absolutely an amazing show. And everybody who joined us this evening, we greatly appreciate it. And while we're here right now, I just got to do one simple thing. I apologize. Let me find my, there it is. Everybody joining us, make sure you check out our social medias, Facebook, TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, and what is that instagram but yes. on that note cindy where can the folks find you on social media and your upcoming mm -hmm. projects please um okay uh instagram i'm preston.cynthia uh facebook i have a personal page and a professional page so they're both cynthia preston and um, there's just more interaction. I don't know how they set up these pro pages, but just, if I, I can't like click on somebody and see if they're posting sleazy pictures to see if I just, it's just weird. So I mostly am on the other one, but I'm sort of on both. Um, so Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, I don't do. I mean, somebody got me, Cynthia Preston years ago, the woman who ran the fan club at General Hospital picked up all of our stuff. So I have that, but I don't really do it. Uh, what other things are there? Um, upcoming projects, I'll just post about them when they're in development. These things take time. Awesome. 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 Well, Cindy, thank you so much for joining us tonight. You're a rock star. I, I commend you on everything you're doing. Please continue to do great work. And, and, and I'm going to give you some positive vibes for all the VR stuff you're doing that I know hey. is going to be great. And, uh, and yeah, uh, without further ado, thank you so much for joining the Indie Escape Network. You're family now. You can come on when anytime you want to promote any of your work. I'm, cool. I'm sure Joe will co-sign that for me. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Joe. This is uh, really fun to talk industry stuff. Obviously, I love it and have been doing it for a very long time. So have a lot of stories. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we definitely will see you again. Have a great weekend. And again, thank you again for spending uh, your Friday night with the IU family. Everybody, Cindy Preston. Thank you both. Thank you. Have a great night. What an amazing woman. Absolutely. I, Absolutely. I, I, I was just watching in awe. Some of these stories that are definitely beneficial to people out there in our industry.
Absolutely. Whether it be film, music, whatever. Yeah. yeah, VR. I mean, again, we could have, we didn't even go that deep into Zelda. Like, again, an animated series, she was the voiceover uh, lead of. So, again, just a, just an insane career. And, again, somebody that I've followed career-wise for a long time. And I'm great she's – I'm great that uh, – I'm glad that she came on tonight because, again, uh, you said we could have definitely went another hour. So oh, thank easily. You. Thank you, Ken, for all the great questions. Sean, you as well. CJ Robles, uh, thank you for watching, brother. Uh, yeah, and thank you, everybody, for watching. Violet Mendoza, my, my partner, my great friend, thank you for watching. Thank you for all those that text me questions and uh, that ask, everybody that asked questions tonight. You guys were great uh, just uh, making it more interactive between, uh, between ourselves uh, here on the show, and that's what we want. We want everybody to uh, the Indie Escape Network goes meta <laughs> from CJ. Uh, but yeah, like again, and, and thanks to Sydney Preston, uh, because again, it's and, and the great words she said, because those are those are things like I said, we had talked about pri prior to the show. But they are they are words that are good for people that are starting to hear like there are cautionary tales of things to look forward look look at in your contracts and and just again just to do your due diligence when you're in this business because you never know who's on the up and up because and you just want to protect yourself no matter what so so thank you again to cindy for those uh inspiring words uh mr ridgely uh you want to speak a little bit more about phantasm absolutely ladies and gentlemen if you are in the orlando area august 19th through the 21st Step over to Phantasm in Orlando. It's going to be a great event. Uh, first time I am going, but Harlow's Haunt is going to be there. That's Terry Gerald's movie. Uh, his cast and crew are going to be there, and we're going to have a panel, and we're going to premiere their trailer at the panel. So it's going to be good times. Awesome, awesome, awesome. It's going to be a great event. Uh, and next week, I know we have another amazing guest that uh, is also multi-talented, an actor, director, producer, writer, uh, also a, a veteran of television and movie, uh, Jeremy London. I jumped the gun. I had to post it. Ah, no, it's all good. <laughs> Kevin Smith's Mall Rats, uh, Party of Five, Seventh Heaven, ton of other great projects. Like I said, he's a director, an actor, screenwriter. Uh, so again, we're going to have another great multifaceted conversation next week with Jeremy London. Well, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Clerks 3 is coming out. They just dropped the trailer. And as you guys know, I co-host the show with David Lee Madison and Scott Chiaffo from Clerks and the upcoming Clerks 3. So we're really excited for Scott Chiaffo. Absolutely. Congrats, Scott. I sent him a message uh, this week when the trailer dropped. It looks amazing. I will definitely be there day one supporting that film. And uh, Kevin Smith is a Jersey boy. So again, I anything know, Kevin does, secret. man. Uh -oh. CJ is going to tell us soon, though. CJ, oh. let us in on it soon. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Spill the beans, CJ. But again, thank you, everybody, for watching uh, and sticking with us. Uh, we appreciate you. Uh, and uh, without further ado, uh, believe in the power of yourselves and the right others. Have a great weekend, everybody. Peace. Nope. I got to say that first. I'll have Chainsaw Jerry on my Manic Monday this coming week. Sorry. Oh, nice. Ooh. Nice. Chainsaw Jerry, my Manic Mondays with CJ Robles. Monday night, be there, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. You heard it here first. Sean Smithton, again, thank you. Jeremy London is awesome, and he will be spread knowledge next week, just like Cindy did tonight. So everybody have a good night. Peace.